Submitted for your consideration, one Kent Easter. Successful, making $400,000 a year. Married with three kids and living in wonderful Irvine, California. And there he is, about to go destroy his life. Can anyone stop him? Stop, Kent. Stop! Don't do it. Stop! Oh, well, I tried. And so Kent goes off to the business center of a hotel near his office. And we begin the latest edition of Stand Up CLE, which we call Easter Charade, in which we reenact the astonishing, inexplicable, ridiculous, inept, unethical, but true revenge plot of two married lawyers. Let's see what Kent's up to next. Please. Yes, uh, hi. Uh, I was calling uh, because uh, my daughter is a student at Plaza Vista Elementary School, uh -huh. and uh, I'm concerned one of the, the parent volunteers there may be uh, 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 under, uh, under the influence or uh, using drugs. Uh, I, I was uh, I just had to go over to the school, and uh, I was uh, I saw a car driving very erratically, and uh, uh, as I was it, it continued on into the into the parking lot of the school, and I was. So I was going there, and I, I just had to look to see who it was and what was going on, and then uh, I, I, I uh, saw them get out, and it, and it looked like they had some uh, put something away in their car and uh, behind their their, their seat was, uh, some drugs, and I they, what they were did they all over the place, and then they went into the school, and I recognized that the woman is one of the parent volunteers for the after after school program, and I'm, I'm concerned that. Uh, or drugs at the school. So you specifically saw her place something behind her seat? Yeah, it looked like she she had some uh, like like like, uh, uh, like like pills or something. Okay. What what is your name? My name is uh, Jay. Jay. Bj. Bj. And what's your last name? Uh, Chandra Sekar. How do you spell that? C h a n d r a s e k h r. Okay. And what's your phone number where we can reach you? Uh, 949. Uh, and do you know this person's name? I, I believe, I think, I think her name is Kelly. Kelly? Yeah, and it's, uh, it's a white uh, PT cruiser. Well, that doesn't seem at all suspicious, does it? By the way, when he gave that false name that sounded Indian, did you notice how he slipped into that horrible, fake Indian accent? Let's listen again. I think her name is Kelly. So, if you think Kent was just a good Samaritan reporting a crime he saw committed, raise your hand. You better not have raised your hand. If so, you've probably already sent money to help out that poor Nigerian prince. Anyway, the police received Kent's call, and Officer Charles Schaefer is sent to investigate. He goes to the school and asks for Kelly. Or, as Kent might have said, Kelly? Kelly is at first panicked. Her husband's a traveling salesman. She's afraid he was in a car accident. No, ma'am, it's not about your husband. We received a phone call claiming that you had been driving erratically at the school around 1.15 p.m. Well, that's impossible. I had parked the car and I was in the school by then. Is there something in your car you shouldn't have? No, not at all. May I search your car? Absolutely. Side note, not always a good idea to agree to let the police search your car. That's Vicodin, marijuana, and Percocet. They're not mine. I swear. They're, they're not mine. Someone must have planted them. He's not gonna buy that, is he? Shaver, every cop has heard that story before, like a million times. Every time police find drugs in a car, the car owner claims the drugs were not his. Even his breath smells of pot, and his hands or mouth are orange from eating 100 Cheetos in the last five minutes. Shaver could have just arrested her, standard procedure, and been done with it. But something did not ring true. Who leaves a bag of pot sticking halfway out of a pouch in their car, asking to be discovered? 
He took Kelly back into the school, gave her sobriety tests. Okay. Touch your right finger to your nose. Touch your left finger to your nose. She passed. Shaver checked with school administrators. They confirmed that Kelly had been inside the school 35 minutes before the caller said he had seen her. And the number the caller gave? We're sorry, you have reached a number that has been disconnected or is no longer in service. If those drugs aren't yours, then how did they get in your car? I have an enemy. She sure did. Let's flash back to one year earlier. I just told him it was one year earlier. Go away, go away. Kelly is the volunteer director of the after-school classroom enrichment program at the Plaza Vista School in Irvine, California. Earlier in the day, there had been a tennis class, and Kelly had the task of rounding up the kids and bringing them in the back door. She had missed one kid who had stood outside for a period of time until the tennis coach had found him and brought him to the front desk. And walking up to her right now is that kid's mother, Jill. Hi, I'm Jill Easter. What happened with my son? I'm so sorry. He had been slow to line up. He usually tends to take his time, but I hadn't missed him when I got the other kids, and so he ended up standing outside for a few minutes. I'm so sorry. Did the tennis coach touch him? Isn't it strange that he brought him to the front? No, it's not strange. Um, a lot of my instructors bring the kids up. Again, I'm just so sorry. How do you sleep at night with the way you treat people? I will get you. Whoa, where did that come from? Seems like an overreaction, doesn't it? But luckily, upon reflection, Jill calmed down and put it all in perspective. Equalizes the odds in favor of rough justice against, you know, helping out the person who needs help, against the bad guy who's doing it, where the system, the police, the, the judicial system, whatnot, can't really help, this kind of lone wolf equalizer. And in each of the cases, what the court said is that the character actually described sort of the theme, this equalizing, in very similar ways. Um, in one, it was the greatest thing a man can do with his life is to give someone an equal. Okay, she released her anger with that larger school officials. Now she can let it go, right? You're a parent at the school. Did you hear what Kelly Peters did to my son? Did you hear what she did to my son? You're a parent at the school. Did you hear what Kelly Peters did to my son? Teach, and we argued it on appeal on the Ninth Circuit. And here, the plaintiff had a treatment with a whole range of, of characters and settings and, and, and plot theme, that type of stuff. And that treatment was compared, was, he sued upon it, and he sued the Empire Television Show outlining you know, a, couple, a few dozen similarities um, across those elements, plot, setting, dialogue, mood. Does the word obsessed come to mind? Ever, ever seen someone try so hard to get someone fired from a volunteer job? Guess she wanted to be sure that, that Kelly Peters would never work for free in Irvine again. And Jill, what Jill wasn't done yet. She demanded the Irvine police look into it. The massive fault line being argued in this case was the propriety of making these decisions. She filed for a restraining order. In jeopardy, there's blackmailing going on. The blackmailing was going on in slightly different ways, but nonetheless... The court threw the claim out, but Jill was not the only one unhappy. So was her husband. And in case you hadn't guessed it by now, her husband is good old Kent Easter. Kent filed a civil suit against Kelly, saying that Peters had committed false imprisonment and intentional infliction of emotional distress against their son, that her son, their son had suffered extreme and severe mental anguish, and asked for punitive damages. He filed the suit himself because, yes, he was a lawyer, and so was his wife, but she was not practicing at the time. He went to UCLA. She went to Berkeley, where neither one apparently took a course on putting things in perspective. And as you will see, Neither one seemed to have paid much attention during their ethics classes. But the Easters did seem to come to their senses and drop the suit. Kelly was elected president of the PTA, and it appeared it was over. It was anything but. Let's go to the night before Kent's phone call. Really? There's Kent planting the drugs. Or wait, was it? 
Or maybe was it? As you will see, we actually don't know who planted the drugs, but it's either Kent or Jill or both. And whoever did it, the other acknowledged knowing it and being in on it. Today's parents had the reputation of being way too overprotective of their kids, seeing their children as all special snowflake miracles who must be watched over, monitored, fawned over as the most amazing creatures who have ever lived. Some say this is a false caricature of modern parenting, but the Easter sure don't help that case. They look like the worst helicopter parents of all time, making the most abusive Little League baseball dad look like Ward Cleaver. For you youngsters, that's from Leave it to Beaver. Look it up. If you're going to be this nuts over your kid, perhaps you should not become a lawyer. Or maybe you should not procreate. But these two lawyers decided Kelly's Peter's insult to their son was so egregious that they should plant drugs in her car and try to frame her. A volunteer whose family made a fraction of Kent Peter's salary. Shows you that getting a law degree does not mean you are a good human being. And this was the result of their perfidy. <laughs> They're not mine! The tale of Kent and Jill Easter is one of stupidity and overreaction. But since this is an ethics presentation, the issue for us is whether the Easter's actions also violated their ethical duties as lawyers. In other words, is framing someone for a crime an ethical violation? I hope your sense of morality makes you want to say yes immediately, but we also know that morality and legal ethics are not the same. So some analysis is required. Which is good, because otherwise this would be a half hour presentation and because I get paid by the minute. I have not found an example of private sector lawyers other than the Easters who have tried to frame someone for a crime he or she did not commit. That's either because no other lawyers have done such a thing, or because the lawyers who wanted to frame innocent people were a lot better at it than the Easters. Unfortunately, there are examples of prosecutors who frame people. Unfortunate because innocent people went to prison, and unfortunate for stand-up CLE because there's not a lot of humor in innocent people going to prison. But we'll proceed with those examples regardless. Cases where prosecutors frame people are generally different from the case of the Easters. I've not found any where the prosecutor actually manufactured the crime in question. There really was a crime, like murder or robbery, or at least some event that could be interpreted as a crime, like someone did die. And usually these bad prosecutors don't out and out create fake evidence. They withhold exculpatory evidence or misrepresent evidence. Also, most of those occasions, I hope the prosecutor believed the defendant committed the crime, but felt the evidence needed some help, though sometimes you have to wonder. One such case is quite well known, you may have heard of it. It was a case of Anthony Graves. There was a horrible multiple murder in Burleson County, Texas in 1992. The police and prosecutors quickly centered on Robert Carter as the murderer. Carter admitted to the murders and said he had accomplices, Anthony Graves and a man he just called Red. Carter was convicted and sentenced to death. Anthony Graves was charged as well. The prosecutor then tried to get Carter to testify against Graves. Carter finally agreed to do so, but the night before he was due to testify, Carter told the prosecutor that he had acted alone in committing the murders. The prosecutor says that this was basically a statement in passing by Carter, that he did not take it seriously, but that he did mention it in passing to defense counsel. He admits they didn't formally disclose it as potentially exculpatory evidence. But the Texas Bar Evidentiary Panel and Board of Disciplinary Appeals believed it was much more than that, that this was a serious statement by Carter, was exculpatory evidence, and that despite his statement of mentioning in the passing, the power panels held that the prosecutor did not disclose it. Prosecutors have special duties that private practice lawyers do not. Under the U.S. Supreme Court, in the case of Brady v. Maryland, prosecutors have a duty to turn over to the defense evidence that might be favorable to the accused. That has been codified as an ethical rule, ABA Model Rule 3.8D, which states that, quote, the prosecutor in a criminal case shall make timely disclosure to the defense of all evidence or information known to the prosecutor that tends to negate the guilt of the accused or mitigates the offense. Texas adopted this rule as Texas Disciplinary Rule of Professional Conduct 3.09D. Thus, the prosecutor in the Graves case had a duty to inform the defense that Carter had stated the night before his testimony they had acted alone. The failure of the prosecutor to tell the defense about Carter's statement that he acted alone was found to be a violation of Rule 3.09D. During the trial, the prosecutor put Carter and an investigator on the stand 
and they both testified that, except for some earlier grand jury testimony, all of Carter's previous statements had implicated Graves. The power panels found that this was false due to the fact that the night before, Carter had stated they had acted alone. <clears throat> that was a statement that did not implicate Graves. So by obvious logic, it was not true that all of Carter's statements had implicated Graves. All lawyers have a duty to not present false evidence at trial. ABA Model Rule 3.3A3, called Candor Towards the Tribunal, states that, quote, a lawyer should not knowingly offer evidence that the lawyer knows to be false. Texas has this rule as Texas Disciplinary Rule of Professional Conduct 3.3A5, which says that, quote, a lawyer should not knowingly offer or use evidence the lawyer knows to be false. So if a lawyer puts a witness on the stand with the knowledge that the witness will testify falsely, and the witness does so, the lawyer has presented false evidence and has committed an ethical violation. Further, even if the lawyer was not aware the false testimony was going to be given, but then his witness does testify falsely, the lawyer has a duty to correct it or bring it to the court's attention. So when the prosecutor called both Carter and the lead investigator to the stand, and they both testified falsely that, except for grand jury testimony, all of Carter's previous statements had implicated Graves, and the prosecutor took no steps to correct the testimony or bring it to the court's attention, he committed an ethical violation. The bar panels held that this was a violation of Texas Disciplinary Rule 3.03A5. During the trial, Graves planned to call an alibi witness. Before the witness could testify, the prosecutor announced in open court that the alibi witness was a suspect in the murders and could be indicted. The witness then refused to testify and left the courthouse. The panelists found that the prosecution had no evidence or information tending to show any involvement by the alibi witness in the murders. ABA Model Rule 3.3A1 states that, quote, a lawyer should not knowingly make a false statement of fact or law to a tribunal or fail to correct a false statement of material fact or law previously made to the tribunal by the lawyer. Texas, Texas Disciplinary Rule 3.03A1 states basically the same, quote, a lawyer should not knowingly make a false statement of material fact or law to a tribunal. A prosecutor telling the court that a potential alibi witness is a suspect in the crime, when the prosecutor has no evidence to show that, is an ethical violation, contrary to Rule 3.3A1, and in Texas, 3.03A1, and the bar panel is so held. The prosecutor also told defense counsel that Carter implicated a man named Red in the murders. The panels found that the prosecutor knew, but did not disclose to defense counsel, that law enforcement identified who Red was and had ruled him out as a suspect, and that Carter confirmed that that person was not involved. The panels also ruled that the prosecutor had failed to disclose to the defense counsel that an important prosecution witness was currently under indictment on other charges. These two pieces of information, like Carter's statement he had acted alone, were exculpatory pieces of evidence that the prosecutor had a duty to disclose. Thus, his failure to do so was a violation of Brady, of ABA Model Rule 3.8D, and Texas Disciplinary Rule 3.09D, and the bar panels so held. The bar panels also found that the prosecutor violated one of our favorite rules, ABA Model Rule 8.4A, entitled Misconduct, which exists in similar form in Texas as Rule 8.04A1. Specifically, Model Rule 8.4A states that, quote, it is professional misconduct for a lawyer to, A, violate or attempt to violate the rules of professional conduct, knowingly assist or induce another to do so, or do so through the acts of another. Texas Disciplinary Rule 8.04A1 states, quote, a lawyer shall not violate these rules, knowingly assist or induce another to do so, or do so through the acts of another, whether or not such violation occurred in the course of a client-lawyer relationship. Now, this is a rule only a lawyer could write in love. You create a whole list of rules saying what a lawyer should and should not do. And if you violate any one of those, you commit an ethical violation, and you get punished for it. And then you add at the end a rule that says that if you violate any of the other rules, you've also committed a violation of this rule. So any ethical violation basically, basically violates at least two rules at once. To invoke the cliche, that seems to have been written by the Department of Redundancy Department. So, of course, the bar panels found the prosecutor violated Rule 8.04A1, 
any opinion finding a violation of a rule will have to find a violation of 8.04A1 as well. More substantively, the panel has also found a violation of 8, Rule 8.04A3, which states that it is professional misconduct for a lawyer to, quote, engage in conduct involving dishonesty, fraud, deceit, or misrepresentation. This is basically identical to Model Rule 8.4C. Making false representation to the court and opposing counsel fits well within this rule. Graves was convicted and sentenced to death. He served 14 years in prison when his conviction was overturned in part because of the improprieties I just laid out. New prosecutors were assigned to retry him, but after four years, they concluded that Graves was innocent and he went free. As for the original prosecutor, a complaint was filed against him that led to the findings of ethical violations I just discussed. Due to all those violations, Texas disparred the prosecutor. And in what may seem as some may see as justice, the person who filed the complaint was none other than the wrongfully convicted defendant, Anthony Graves. So in case you intuitively didn't know, you can see how serious it is, serious it is for a prosecutor to try to frame a defendant. It could create an enemy who will eventually cost you your profession. Now, you may say, wait, that wasn't really a framing. The prosecutor didn't create false evidence. I would say that withholding escapulatory evidence, and especially lying about the existence of evidence to keep an alibi witness from testifying, is the same as framing someone for a crime. At least, it's similar enough, similar enough for this presentation. Let us look at another prosecutor who tried to railroad defendants and ran afoul of the disciplinary rules when doing so. A prosecutor who handled an even more famous case, one the vast majority have heard of, the Duke Lacrosse case. By the way, remember when I said that prosecutors generally don't just try to make up crimes or prosecute people for crimes they don't think were committed? This may be an exception. For those of you who, between March 2006 and April 2007, never read a newspaper, never watched a TV show, never listened to a radio report, basically, for those of you who were in a medically induced coma for over a year, let me briefly lay out what happened in what's known as the Duke Lacrosse case. In March 2006, members of the Duke University lacrosse team had a party at a house off campus. Two strippers were hired to perform. After the strippers left, one of them reported to police that she had been raped at the party. Calling what happened next a media firestorm would be a vast understatement. The accuser was black, the Duke lacrosse team was mostly white, and seen by some as privileged. Despite the denials by the team members, there were massive protests against them. Their coach was fired. Their season was suspended. One of the factors in creating this firestorm was Mike Nifong district attorney for the jurisdiction where the crime allegedly occurred. Normally, a case like this would have been handled by an assistant district attorney. But the state bar found that Nifong, who was in a tough re-election fight, immediately recognized that the case would garner significant media attention and decided to handle the case by himself. ABA Model Rule 3.6a, which North Carolina has pretty much adopted as North Carolina Rule of Professional Conduct 3.6a, states that a lawyer who is participating or has participated in the investigation or litigation of a matter shall not make an extrajudicial statement that the lawyer knows or reasonably should know will be disseminated by means of public communication and will have a substantial likelihood of materially prejudicing, prejudicing an adjudicative proceeding in the matter. These rules are even more restrictive for prosecutors. ABA Model Rule 3.8F which is pretty much the same as North Carolina Rule 3.8F, states that the prosecutor in a criminal case shall, quote, accept for statements that are necessary to inform the public of the nature and extent of the prosecutor's action and that serve a legitimate law enforcement purpose, refrain from making extrajudicial comments that have a substantial likelihood of heightening public condemnation of the accused. <clears throat> Mike Nifong apparently had never heard of those, either of those rules. Indeed, Nifong should perhaps get an award as stand-up CLE's most prolific violator of an ethical rule. Others we have looked at, real or fictional, may have engaged in more serious ethical violations, although Nifong's were truly bad. But I cannot think of another whose quantity of work matches Nifong. Nifong apparently couldn't find a camera or reporter he didn't like, and he went on a publicity spree that would make Kim Kardashian look media shy. He gave interviews far and wide, with no regard for the restrictions of the ethical rules. He spoke to WRAL-TV, 
ABC 11 TV News, The New York Times, NBC 17 News, The Durham Herald Sun, CBS News, ESPN, MSNBC, Raleigh News and Observer, USA Today, ABC News, The Charlotte Observer, CNN, Newsweek, and Tiger Beat. Okay, I made the last one up just to see if you're paying, trying to see if you're paying attention. Here are some of the statements Nifong made. That he was considering charging other players for not coming forward with information. And that his, quote, guess is that some of this stonewall of silence that we have seen may tend to crumble once charges start to come out. Quote, I'm disappointed that no one has been enough of a man to come forward. And if they had spoken up at the time, this may never have happened. Quote, there's no doubt a sexual assault took place. Quote, I'm making a statement to the Durham community, Durham community, and as a citizen of Durham, I'm making a statement for the Durham community. This is not the kind of activity we condone, and it must be dealt with quickly and harshly. Quote, and one would wonder why one needs an attorney if one was not charged, has not done anything wrong. That's an interesting one for a lawyer to make. Suppose a potential client came to you and said the police wanted to talk to him about a high-profile crime. Would you say to him, Hey, if you've done nothing wrong, you don't need me. Innocent people are never charged with crimes. Let me go represent guilty people. Don't pay attention to the more than 387 convictions that have been overturned by DNA evidence since 1989, or the other instances of convictions being overturned because the defendant was actually innocent. I think in a case like that, it's a good idea to get a lawyer. You know, while the number of convicted people later proven innocent is a small percentage of total convictions, foregoing legal representation is a good way to get into that club you don't want to join. More statements by Nifong. Quote, I'm convinced there was a rape. Yes, sir. Quote, in this case, we are the act of rape, essentially a gang rape. It's bad, it is bad enough in and of itself. But when it's made with racial epithets against the victim, I mean it's, it's just absolutely unconscionable. Quote, the contempt that was shown for the victim based on her race was totally abhorrent. It adds another layer of reprehensibleness to a crime that was already reprehensible. Quote, what happened here was one of the worst things that happened since I became district attorney. Quote, I think that most people in this community are appalled. These kind of statements clearly had a substantial likelihood of prejudicing any trial, and certainly heightened to like the sky the public condemnation of the accused. Indeed, the Disciplinary Commission of the North Carolina State Bar listed an astounding 30 actually more than 30 statements by Nifong that violated Rule 3.6 and Rule 3.8F, and said that was only some of the statements made by Nifong in violation of the rules. Think of it. Way over 30 violations of the same rule, ethical rule, and in only one case. Congratulations, Mike. You're the winner of the Biggest Violator of Ethical Rules Award. Feel free to come to LA to collect your trophy in a case of turtle wax. Okay, you might say. Maybe Nifong went a bit overboard, but don't prosecutors really give these kind of statements all the time? And what do you expect when a prosecutor is presented with such a horrible crime? But here's the thing. When Nifong first discussed the case with police investigators, they told him there were great weaknesses in the case. The accused made inconsistent statements and had changed her story several times. The other dancer of the party denied the claim of the attack, that the accused could not identify any attackers, that the three team captains denied an assault had occurred. At or within a few days of this briefing, Nifong said the case would very, be very hard to win in court and quote, you know, we're fucked. A very good legal analysis. Yet, he nonetheless went out and said with certainty attacks had occurred, misrepresented physical evidence, etc. Then Nifong started receiving the results of DNA tests. The police had obtained DNA samples of all 46 members of the Duke lacrosse team that had attended the party. Evidence commonly called a rape kit had been collected, which included swabs of different parts of the accuser and her underwear. Nifong had DNA tests performed on the items from the rape kit, and DNA from four males were found. None of them matched anyone on the Duke team, but one did match her boyfriend. Despite that evidence, Nifong indicted two players. 
Nifon did not produce to the defendants the information the rape kit had, had come back with multiple males who were not Duke players. Instead, he instructed the DNA examiner only to produce the results that matched the boyfriend and results from fingernail samples that matched two players. He told the examiner not to include the results that showed matches with other unidentified, unidentified males who were not Duke players. Nifon continued this concealment. When asked for all tests in discovery, and when asked by the court what tests existed, Nifong repeatedly said that all, that all that existed were the results he had produced. Nifong's deception was eventually uncovered. He resigned from the case. Other prosecutors took over and declared the Duke players innocent. As you should know from the discussion of the Graves case, Nifong's withholding the DNA evidence was a violation of Brady v. Maryland and ABA Model Rule 3.8 which North Carolina has, adapted, has adopted as its Rule 3.8. Nifong, like the Gray's prosecutor, had a duty to turn over exculpatory evidence, and North Carolina, North Carolina Bar ruled that the DNA evidence, which showed specimens of multiple males who were not Duke players on the rape kit samples, was exculpatory. The North Carolina Bar found that Nifong had violated Rule 3.8. There was also ABA Model Rule 3.4D, which is similar to North Carolina, Carolina Rule 3.4D which says that a lawyer shall not, quote, fail to make reasonably diligent efforts to comply with a legally proper discovery request by an opposing party. The only effort Nifong made in response to the discovery request was to obstruct it. It was an easy call for the North Carolina Bar to find that an ethical violation. The North Carolina Bar also was not pleased that Nifong lied in open court about the DNA tests. As we discussed, ABA, ABA Model Rule 3.3A1 which is also North Carolina Rule 3.3A1, says that, quote, a lawyer should not make a false statement of law, fact or law, to a tribunal. Also like the prosecutor in the Graves case, Nifong was violated, found to have violated North Carolina's version of Rule 8.4. You know, the one that says that a lawyer should not, quote, engage in conduct involving dishonesty, fraud, deceit, or misrepresentation? If you don't know why Nifong's conduct is in violation of that rule, then I think you need a lot more ethical training than this one hour. Interestingly, the North Carolina Bar also found Nifong in violation of North Carolina Rule of Professional Conduct 4.1, which is the same as ABA Model Rule 4.1a. Quote, in the course of representing a client, a lawyer should not knowingly make a false statement of material fact or law to a third person. I have mentioned this rule in past presentations when talking about fictional lawyers who lied to third parties. As a lawyer, when you're representing a party, you do have to be truthful when talking to third parties. But the interesting thing is that the false statements the bar used as the basis for this violation were not statements to the press. It was the false representations of the court and the counsel for the Duke defendants regarding the DNA evidence. So the court and our opposing counsel are third parties. You're an advocate. But nonetheless, you're not allowed to make untruthful statements of material fact or law to opposing counsel. Now, don't panic. This doesn't mean you have to tell all when negotiating with opposing counsel. As I've discussed in other presentations in more depth, the notes to Rule 4.1 says that, quote, under generally accepted conventions in negotiation, certain type of statements ordinarily are not take, taken as statements of material fact. Estimates of price or value placed on, a sub, on the subject of a transaction and a party's intention as an acceptable settlement of a claim are, no, are ordinarily in this category. So, while statements about what is your client's negotiating position may sound like facts, they actually aren't facts. So you don't have to be truthful about them. In other words, you can still say your client won't settle for paying less than $10 million, when in reality, right now, he'll take $50,000 cash. As a result of all he did, Nifong was disbarred to, like, no one's surprise. Then there was a case of Prosecutor L. Forrest Price, which went to the California Supreme Court. Price was a deputy district attorney for nearly 12 years and senior trial attorney for approximately one and a half years. In April 1976, he was assigned the responsibility of prosecuting Stewart, who was charged with two murders. Curiously, the California Supreme Court never said what Stewart's first name was. Just called him Stewart throughout the whole case. Maybe he was just like Madonna or Sting and went by one name only. A lawyer was appointed counsel for Stewart in May and served through trial and sentencing. 
and Stewart represented himself as co-counsel throughout. Defense counsel made at least two pretrial requests for discovery of all pertinent matters from the Office of the District Attorney, and Prosecutor Price assured defense counsel that all such information had been furnished. During cross-examination, however, defense counsel discovered that a cab driver whose testimony placed, placed Stewart at, at or near the scene of one of the alleged murders in 1973 had prepared a trip ticket containing entries of dates, times, and places of passenger pickups and deliveries at or about the time of the alleged murder. The ticket had not been provided to the defense, though it had been in possession of the San Diego Police Department since May 1974. Defense counsel requested a copy of the ticket from Price, who said he did not have one. Price then obtained a copy from the cab driver on completion of the driver's testimony and during a recess. The ticket contained entries that were inconsistent with the driver's testimony as to the time and place he had picked up Stewart. Time and place in the, were not in themselves important to the people's case, but they were important, though, in, in the sense that the discrepancies between entries prepared in 1973 and the driver's testimony in 1976 could be used to impeach his credibility as a witness. <clears throat> so now the prosecutor Price had in his possession potential exculpatory evidence and had a duty to turn it over to the defense. And good news, he actually did so. But bad news, he did so only after altering the ticket by changing the time and place of a customer fare relevant to the driver's carriage of Stewart, so that it became consistent with the driver's testimony. He then destroyed the original copy after photocopying and supplying a photo of the alleged of the altered copy to the defense counsel, representing it to be true and genuine. The aim was to mislead defense counsel and to prevent his using the original or true copy to impeach the driver. Unfortunately for Price, defense counsel was not the trusting type, and he sought the court's aid in securing the original of the ticket, and Price agreed to produce it. But the original was not immediately obtainable for the police, so he produced another copy, unaltered, obtained from the CAD company. Defense counsel noted the alteration and demanded in court that the original be produced. Price agreed to produce it on the next court day, a Tuesday following a three-day weekend. On, that, on the day before the court reconvened, Price requested a private meeting in chambers with the judge. Their discussion was not reported or recorded, and defense counsel was not present. Price told the judge he had altered the copy before supplying to the defense counsel, but the judge apparently took no action in response. Price then gave the original ticket to defense counsel. At a, meter, at a meeting later that day attended by Price, defense counsel, attended by Price, defense counsel, and the judge, Price sought unsuccessfully to prevent the admission into evidence of the altered copy. His responsibility for the discrepancy between the two versions of the ticket was not revealed to defense counsel during that meeting or to the jury or anyone else except the judge during trial. The jury returned a verdict of second degree murder in November 1976. Before expiration of the 60 day period for filing a notice of appeal and before sentencing, Price contacted Stewart in jail he sought and received Stewart's promise to refrain from filing an appeal as conviction in exchange for Price's promise to seek a more favorable sentence and out-of-state incarceration. Defense counsel was neither notified of nor present at the meeting. Price testified that his chief reason for wanting Stewart not to appeal was to keep Price's misconduct in altering the ticket from being revealed. Despite their agreement, however, Stewart filed a timely appeal. In July 1977, Price's efforts to secure a more favorable sentence failed. Increasingly concerned that his misconduct would come to light on appeal, he revealed his alteration of the ticket to a superior in the district attorney's office, hoping that people in the office would be able, be able to, quote, straighten it out by securing a more favorable sentence for Stewart. Instead, it was straightened out by Price being suspended from his job and the matter of his misconduct being referred to the attorney general. The Attorney General tried Price for preparing, a, for preparing a false record with intents to produce it and allowed, for, and allowed it to be produced for deceitful purpose, as genuine or true, upon a trial authorized by law, in violation of Penal Code Section 134. Despite the facts laid out, Price was acquitted, but never reinstated as a prosecutor. Now, the ethical violation here is obvious. Right at the top, you have ABA Model Rule 3.4a, which says that, quote, a lawyer should not unlawfully obstruct another party's access to evidence or unlawfully alter, destroy, or conceal a document or other material 
having potential uh, evidentiary value. Price's actions were about as on point a violation as one could imagine. The rule says you can't alter a document, and Price altered a document. However, this is 1976 in California, and at that time, California did not have a rule precisely like Rule 3.4. But the California Supreme Court had no problem finding California statutes and rules that Price violated. For starters, California Business and Profession Code, Section 6106, states that, states that quote, the commission of any act involving moral turpitude, dishonesty, or corruption, whether the act is committed in the course of his relations as an attorney or otherwise, and whether the act is a felony or misdemeanor or not, constitutes a cause or disbarment or suspension. If the act constitutes a felony or misdemeanor, conviction thereof in a criminal proceeding is not a condition precedent to disbarment or suspension from practice therefore. The Supreme Court concluded that Price's actions were ones of, mor were ones of moral turpitude. I'll discuss moral turpitude in depth a little later. California Business and Professions Code section 6103 says that, quote, any violation of the oath taken by a lawyer or of the lawyer's duties as, a, as a such attorney constitute causes for disbarment or suspension. The court found that Price's actions violate his attorney's oath and duties. Then California Rule of Professional Conduct 7107, the rule in those days, said that, quote, a member shall not suppress any evidence that the member or the member's client has a legal obligation to reveal or to produce. Altering the ticket, then destroying the, the copy, is a pretty clear suppression of the ticket. And the court found that Price violated that rule. The court also found that Price violated Business Profession Code Section 6128, which says that, quote, every attorney is guilty of a misdemeanor who is guilty of any deceit or collusion or consents to any deceit or collusion with intent to deceive the court or any party. And also find him a violation of then Rule of Professional Conduct 7-105, which said that, quote, in presenting a matter to a tribunal, a member shall employ, for the purpose of maintaining the causes confided to the member, such, me such, a means, o such means only as are consistent with truth, and shall not seek to mislead the judge, judicial officer, or jury by an artifice or false statement of fact or law. Besides these pretty, probably pretty obvious violations, the court found another violation. Business and Professions Code Section 6131, Subdivision B, provides that, quote, every attorney is guilty of a misdemeanor and, in addition to the punishment prescribed therefore, should be disbarred, who, having himself prosecuted any action or proceeding in any court as district attorney or other public prosecutor, afterwards, directly or indirectly, advises in relation to, or takes any part in the defense thereof, as attorney or otherwise, or takes and receives any valuable consideration from or on behalf of any defendant in any such action upon any understanding or agreement, whatever, having relation to the defense thereof. An interesting law that many not be aware of. If you prosecute a defendant, you can't turn around and defend him in the same case. It would be a rather ethical conflict to represent one side in a case than the other, but few would probably know it was an actual crime. By the way, all those statutes I laid out are still on the books in California. Significantly for, for Price, now significantly for Price was the second part of the statute I just discussed, which states the prosecutor cannot take or receive any valuable consideration from or on behalf of any defendant in any such action upon any understanding or agreement, whatever, having relation to the defense thereof. Price received Stewart's promise to abandon an appeal in exchange for Price's promise to seek more favorable sentencing for Stewart. That Price sought the promise for concerns personal to himself, that that amounted to a valuable consideration. Quote, to wit, concealing or minimizing the fact they did alter a document during the course of this trial, and that this had not been revealed to defense counsel or the defendant. And the Supreme Court found that by those actions, Price willfully violated Section 6131. While it did not state so explicitly, the court apparently felt that that showed moral turpitude as well. Price got lucky, though. The court felt that certain mitigating factors weighed against permanent disbarment. Among those mitigating factors was that, quote, he was under mental and emotional stress for some time prior to and during the period when his misconduct occurred. 
because he worked long hours under a heavy caseload. Let me get this straight. Working long hours can mitigate punishment? <laughs> wow. Every associate, every big law firm must be free to violate as many laws as he wants and never be disbarred. Anyway, the court basically put him on five years probation with two years of actual suspension from the practice of law. By the way, what was the deal with the judge in the original trial case? He agrees to an ex-party meeting with a prosecutor, learns the prosecutor altered evidence, and he says and does nothing? Maybe you could get away with that before the California Code of Judicial Ethics was adopted in 1996. I didn't research whether there were other canons for judges in effect then. But under current ethic rules, an ex-party meeting is prohibited, and a judge will be required to report a lawyer's ethical violation, such as altering a piece of evidence. Thus, once again, we see the ethical issues involved in framing someone. But what about the Easters, you might say, assuming you still remember them by now? You might be saying, hey, Wooster, the stories about the prosecutors are all well and good, but the Easters were not prosecutors, and thus did not have special obligations, and their actions had nothing to do with representing clients or their practice of law at all. I'd respond, first, it's Mr. Wooster to you. And second, I hope all of you know that the ethical duties of lawyers do not just come into play when you're practicing law. It's not just about your actions with regard to clients, opposing counsel, courts, witnesses. It's not just about how you handle cases and matters for clients, how you handle their money, etc. As officers of the court, you have a duty to the law, and if you break the law, even on your own free time, to avenge some small insult you perceive your chi child received, the bar, the bar may have something to say about it. And they did, what, they did when it came to the Easters. But let us first tell the rest of the story. We left the tale of the Easters at this point. They're not mine! Normally, a police officer would never believe the those are my drugs defense. But luckily for Kelly and for justice, policeman Shaver adds everything up, knows something is wrong, and does not arrest Kelly. Instead, the case goes to narcotics detectives at the Irvine Police Department. You will note that the narcotics detectives all bore striking resemblance to police officer Shaver, or that we were too cheap to hire any more actors. So the detectives listen to the call. Note that no one by the name of V.J. Chandraskar has a kid at the school, and the caller slipped into that horrible Indian accent. It's all terribly suspicious. Still, it's hard for them to believe that two well-to-do lawyers would be involved in a plot like that. And there was a dad at the school who exhibited bizarre behavior and had wanted the PTA presidency that Kelly had obtained. Police thought he was a more likely suspect. They traced the phone call to the hotel business center, reviewed the security footage of the hotel, looking for the PTA rival. He never showed up. But look who did. Let's do a quick review. Kent doesn't call from his own phone, doesn't give his own name, doesn't give his own phone number, clearly doesn't want to be identified as the caller. So he goes to a landline phone, which can easily be traced, and a location which has security cameras, which will record his entering just before the call is made. What an airtight plan. So the police now decide the Easters are their main suspects. And this is what the Easters really did not anticipate, that this case would truly tick off the Irvine police. Indeed, it is a case that ticks off just about everybody who hears about it. Something about the class issue, about rich and powerful people trying to squash an innocent volunteer, rubs people the wrong way. So the Irvine police don't just investigate the Easters, they put everything behind it. Literally half the Irvine police department is in on this case at one time or the other. Something way beyond our budget to reenact. Just take my word for it. The police looked into the Easters' cell phone records find out that they, they exchanged 15 texts between 2.37 a.m. and 4.21 a.m. the night before the drugs were discovered. And during that time, Kent's Blackberry was pinging off the cell tower near Kelly Peters' apartment. And yes, you do know this happened back in 2011 because Kent actually had a Blackberry. And again, you can see how idiotic this plan was. Not realizing that bringing your cell phones would place you right at the scene of the crime. The police watched the Easters for weeks. Then we come to March 4th, 2011. Almost two dozen police officers gathered at the station to rehearse their plan. 
They have warrants to search the Easter's house and Kent's office. They decide they'll talk to Kent, who doesn't know that he and his wife had been under surveillance, to see if they can get some stuff out of him. At first, Kent seemed happy to see the police. Are you aware of anything that happened recently at Plaza Vista Elementary? Now, we had a problem last year, and my son had been locked out of the school. A volunteer had berated him for being slow. We filed complaints, but didn't want to press the issue. We decided to move on. Bygones be bygones. Do you know Kelly Peters? No, never met her. <laughs> Don't know what she looks like. As the questions get more pointed, Kent no longer seems so happy. Are you recording this? Yes, I am. Have you heard of anything happening to Kelly Peters lately? Has she been in trouble? No. Well, I've been following you. I've seen you coming out of the dry cleaners. So the question you have to ask yourself is this, as an educated man, what the heck am I doing following you around? Why am I standing here talking to you? I, d I definitely am. Think back two and a half weeks ago. Any reason you would have to be out in the wee hours of the morning? Now and, that, now and then I run out for diapers, but odds are I was home. Now, I want you to use that big brain of yours, shut your mouth and listen. At some point during this conversation, you're gonna have a big boy decision to make and that's gonna be on you. We know your phone was pinging in the middle of the night near Kelly Peters' apartment. And if your DNA is on those drugs we found in Kelly's car, we'll find it. So, given what I've just told you, is there anything you would like to add to your statement to me? I wanna to talk to a lawyer. <laughs> that's the big boy decision. And that's a search warrant. Okay, this is not a class in police interrogation tactics, but I do wonder, what was the purpose of that questioning? I thought they were trying to get him to say something helpful to the prosecution, but instead they got him to clam up and ask for a lawyer. Hadn't they watched all those TV shows where the police do all they can to avoid the suspect lawyering up? Anyway, the police searched the Easter's house and Kent's office. In Kent's car, they found a baggie containing some diet pills. And the label on the bag? Brilliant. Having in your possession the same kind of pill pouch you use to plant drugs. Wouldn't it have just been easier to leave a note saying, I frame Kelly Peters? The police tested the drugs found in Kelly Peters' car. The Easters cleverly left their DNA on the evidence. Jill Easter's DNA was on the pot pipe and the Vicodin. And Ken Easter's was on both of those, plus the Percocet. Had any of them ever seen an episode of CSI? The prosecutors pounded the evidence for a year while they wrangle over access to Kent's phone and other issues. They do finally get access to the phone, but the text messages the night before the drugs were, the night the drugs were planted had been deleted. The Easter's got one small part of their crazy plot right. Still, the prosecutors decide they had enough. The Easter's thought they had a deal to turn themselves into the police, but instead they are arrested and marched into county jail, giving new mean, meaning to the term Easter Parade. Come on, you had to know that was coming. The Easter's mugshots are on the news and soon all across the internet. That's not a look you want. Kent is fired from his big law firm job. The Easter's are vilified from coast to coast. Again, this case, these successful people trying to destroy an innocent volunteer boils people's blood. The story receives big coverage from both local and national media. This coverage continues through and past the trial. ABC did several stories on it. And one of them, ABC News said it was, quote, revenge gone wrong, and a, quote, PTA plot gone wrong. Which leads to the question, how would this plot have gone right? If the Easters had covered their tracks better, and Kelly Peters had been wrongfully charged, convicted, and sent to jail, would that have been considered a revenge plot gone well? All would have been good with the world? ABC News needed an editor on that one. So, the Easters are charged with felonies and the DA will not agree to reduce the charges to misdemeanors. I told you he was ticked off. Then more twists and turns. Jill pleads guilty to one felony count of false imprisonment by fraud and deceit, and is sentenced to 120 days in county jail, of which she serves half, plus community service. But this actually worries the prosecution, because they are afraid that Jill will testify she planned the drugs, and Kent, who was still the breadwinner in the family and needed his law license, was innocent. 
and this indeed is Kent's defense, that he was bullied and manipulated by his wife. Kent's lawyer tells the jury, and yes, I'm going to quote him because we're not hiring another actor. He tells them that, quote, while Kent is a very good human being, he didn't have a backbone when it came to his wife. She wore the pants in the family. She pushed him around. I know many women who wear pants a lot. Do they all push their husbands around? His lawyer also says the following. This is a case of a trusting husband. No more, no less. But it's also a case that sadly, as we've all learned after the fact, about a dishonest wife. So, pinning it all on the wife. Very noble. Then Kent Easter takes the stand in his defense. He testifies that his wife was obsessed with Kelly Peters. He produces an email he said she sent, the ray line being, quote, need to get serious, demanding all sorts of actions against Kelly Peters, background check, arrest, restraining order. She wanted to sue Peters, the school, the school district, everyone but the groundskeeper, I guess. And then it ended with this. By the way, that's 68 exclamation points. Hard to do even if the button is stuck in your keyboard. She thought I had let her down. No, I had failed. I hadn't pushed hard enough on this. Kent Easter testified that his wife had planned the drugs without his knowledge, then called him the next morning, claiming that she had seen Peters popping pills and driving like a madwoman, and then he called the police, which he did so, so, so that she would not call him a failure. That call was played in court with his bad attempt at an Indian accent. It's incredibly uncomfortable to sit here and listen to something so ridiculous. I feel stupid for having believed her and put my entire career and children in jeopardy. Finally, some common ground we can share with Kent Easter. He should have felt stupid. Then, as part of the defense, they play a portion of the conversation that Jill had with her boyfriend. Oh yeah, during all this, Jill was having a torrid affair with a firefighter who agreed with the Irvine police to wear a wire. Are these real people or characters in a bad movie? I am not going to be fine. Do you understand me? Don't just put your head in the sand. This is the moment. This is when I needed someone, and you turned your back on me. And I will not survive this. That's the voice I heard when I saw the we need to get serious email. That's the voice that plays in my mind. I mean, that's when she's upset about something and when she wants something. Well, that's a pleasant thought, having that voice in your head. Though I doubt having that voice in my head would still tempt me to destroy my career and my life. Then the big moment in the trial, Jill Easter coming in to testify. The prosecution was convinced she would testify that she did it all to get her husband off the hook so he continued to practice law. But she never showed up. The defense rested and the jury hung 11-1 for conviction. So they did the trial all over, all over again, and this time, Jill Easter does show up. But guess what? Jill now says she's deaf, and she wants not only a sign language interpreter, but a screen to read the lawyer's questions in real time. The court denies that request, and Jill never testifies. Kent is convicted in two hours. The judge gives him a day to sort out his affairs before going to jail. According to court filings, when Kent told Jill the bad news, she, she suggested, among other things, that he kill himself so she could collect, should collect on his $500,000 life insurance policy. Glad to see the love never went out of their relationship. Rather than death, Kent chose door number two, jail. Lucky for him, it was jail, county jail. The judge really wanted to send him to state prison. We could have gone for three years, but the prisons were full, so Kent got 180 days in county jail, which he served about half that time, plus probation and community service. The Easters have a divorce battle during which he says she became depressed, took anti-anxiety med medication, and binged on Netflix for days. Binging on Netflix for days. I call that an average weekend. But they get divorced, and it's finally over. Of course it's not over. Kelly Peters rightfully files a civil suit against Kent and Jill. At first, Kent sticks to his story, says he knew nothing of the plan to frame Kelly. But then a trial gets more vague, when asked if he had conspired to plant drugs in Kelly's car, he says, Very stupidly and very unfortunately, yes. When asked who planned the drugs, he says, My wife. Then Jill testifies. 
Apparently, her hearing came back. A medical miracle. When asked if she planned the drugs in Kelly Peters' car, she testifies. I pled guilty to it. But did you do it? No. No! No! Now she says she didn't do it? But I guess we can't be too surprised. When you've told your, husband, you told your husband that he should kill himself, that's a sign you're not planning to stand by your man. Now Kent gives his closing. I'm simply a parent of a young family that is broke. So I really come here having already lost everything except for my family. And I submit that there is no further point to additional punishment. The jury found a point to additional punishment, $5.7 million worth. The tale of Kent and Jill Easter is not just one of stupidity and overreaction. It is also one of a massive breach of legal ethics. Now, not any legal violation is a violation of the ethical rules. But let's go back to trustee ABA model rule 8.4. Here's what some of it says, quote, is professional misconduct for a lawyer to commit a criminal act that reflects, affects adversely on the lawyer's honesty, trustworthiness, or fitness as a lawyer in other respects, engage in conduct involving dishonesty, fraud, deceit, or misrepresentation, or engage in conduct that is prejudicial to the administration of justice. A version of Rule 8.4 exists in most states. And the Easters would have hit the trifecta under Rule 8.4. Their crime fell under all three of the provisions I just cited. Framing an innocent person for drug possession for any reason certainly reflects adversely in a lawyer's honesty, trustworthiness, and fitness as a lawyer, unless you have a really warped view of what you want in a lawyer. The crime they were convicted of was false imprisonment by fraud or deceit. When the words fraud and deceit are actually contained in the name of the crime you committed, it pretty much seals the deal that you engage in conduct involving fraud and deceit. And they are trying to get someone wrong if they're convicted of a crime, which would be prejudicial to the administration of justice. And that they did it for no good reason at all just makes it seem worse. <clears throat> so under Rule 8.4, the Easter's would have been cooked like an Easter goose. But they were California lawyers. And ironically, at that time, the California Rules of Professional Conduct did not contain a rule totally analogous to AB Rule 8.4. Now, in November 2018, California changed its rules, so they pretty much parallel the ABA model rules. And they now do contain an 8.4. So the Easters committed these violations any time after 2008, November 2018, they would have been in violation of that rule. But at that time, they weren't. But there were plenty of other rules for them to violate. For example, there exists and existed and exists a provision of the Business Professions Code, ones I've discussed, some I've discussed above. One of those codes, a different one, is Section 6102C, which says that if a lawyer is convicted of a crime, quote, the Supreme Court shall summarily disbar the attorney if the offense is a felony under the laws of California, the United States, or any state or territory thereof. And the element of the offense is a specific intent to deceive, defraud, steal, or make or suborn a false statement, or involve moral turpitude. So now you see, now you see how the Easter status as lawyers hurt so much, so, so much in this case. It wasn't just that it really ticked off people that lawyers acted in this way. It also appears that it led to the prosecution being unwilling to let them plead to misdemeanors. He may well have wanted to be sure the Easters would not be practicing law anytime soon. A felony conviction could result in summar summary disbarment. So were the Easters subject to summary disbarment under California law? Again, since they were convicted of false imprisonment by fraud or deceit, it meets the criterion of being a felony with a specific intent to deceive or defraud. So yes, that alone warranted disbarment. Was it also a crime involving moral turpitude? The California Supreme Court in In Re Lazansky, 25 Cal 4th 11, said that any old moral turpitude does not warrant disbarment. It said that, quote, discipline may be imposed only for criminal conduct having a logical relationship to attorney's fitness to practice. And the term moral turpitude must be defined accordingly. After saying it must be defined that way, the court said the term could not be defined with precision. So after completely confusing everyone, saying the term must be defined one way, but actually it can't be precisely defined, the court said, quote, Nevertheless, we can provide this guidance. Criminal conduct not committed in the practice of law or against a client 
reveals moral turpitude if it shows a deficiency in any character trait necessary for the practice of law, such as trustworthiness, honesty, fairness, candor, and fidelity to fiduciary duties. Or if it involves such a serious breach of duty owed to another, to another or to society, or such a flagrant disrespect for the law or for societal norms, that knowledge of the attorney's conduct would be likely to undermine public confidence in and respect for the legal profession. That's a bit of a mouthful there, but here's a question it raises. What kind of crime that involves moral turpitude would not fall within that definition, or guidance, or whatever they would call it? I mean, how can you commit a crime of moral turpitude that doesn't show a serious breach of duty owed to another or to society, or doesn't show a flagrant disrespect of law or societal norms? Is there some kind of moral turpitude that shows great respect for the law and societal norms? Note that the Lazansky court doesn't actually give an example of a crime that involves moral turpitude. It is not the kind of moral turpitude that justifies disbarment. So, while the California Supreme Court says in theory that not necessarily any crime involving moral turpitude calls for disbarment, I think if you're a California lawyer and you want to hold on to your license to practice law, a lawyer anywhere in the U.S., you're better off not committing any crimes of moral turpitude, rather than trying to find one that you, you can commit and still remain a lawyer. And by the way, as a matter of pure morality and as a civilized human being, you shouldn't commit such crimes regardless of its effect on your law license. As for the Easters, it's pretty obvious that their crime fell within the California Supreme Court's definition of an offense warranting disbarment. Their actions were dishonest, unfair, and involved a lack of candor. Their crime involved a breach of their duty to Kelly Peters and a flagrant disrespect for the law and societal norms such that the public would likely lose respect for the legal profession when they heard lawyers had committed such acts. It sure didn't help the reputation of lawyers as a whole. The California State Bar sure saw it that way. Upon their convictions, it quickly held the Easter's convictions were for, were for moral turpitude and summarily disbarred them both. By the way, any of the Easter's had been convicted only of misdemeanors, even if, even if they had never been charged. Their law licenses were still in, well in jeopardy. Business Professions Code 6102 deals with, with summary, essentially automatic disbarment. But as I said when talking about Prosecutor Price, Business Professions Code 6106 states that, quote, the commission of any act involving moral turpitude, dishonesty, or corruption, whether the act is committed in the course of his relations as an attorney or otherwise, and whether the act is a felony or misdemeanor or not, constitutes a cause for disbarment or suspension. If the act constitutes a felony or misdemeanor, conviction thereof in a criminal proceeding is not a condition precedent to disbarment or suspension from practice, therefore. Thus, even if the prosecution had decided it was not worth pursuing the Easters for their crimes, the state bar, if it had become aware of their actions, could have looked at the Easters' actions, and if it decided that they had acted to frame Kelly Peters, disbarred or suspended them from practice, just like happened to Price. You don't have to be convicted or even charged with a crime to be punished by the state bar. That's a relief. I would hate to think that California believes the lawyer is totally free and clear and fit to practice law if he can just avoid a felony conviction. So the legal, ethical moral of the story is don't frame people for crimes. Even if you think they insulted your amazing, miraculous spawn. In the end, it could mean said spawn have parents without money. Of course, the story didn't end with a civil verdict. Dr. Phil did a show in this crazy series of events, and Jill Easter, her herring still intact, agreed to an interview with Dr. Phil. She denied any involvement in the planting of the drugs, claimed her DNA was on the planted drugs because it was transfer DNA. By the way, that may sound nutty, but it actually is a thing. Look it up. That she didn't hand out flyers on school grounds, that Kelly Peters threatened her, etc. Suffice it to say, the interview did not get very good reviews in the press. Later, Kent gave an interview to the LA Times, in which he backtracked off many of the claims he made at trial about his ex-wife. He, he, he says he pressured her to plead guilty in the hopes he would go free. He said, quote, She was made out to be this cartoonish, vill cartoonish villainess, this master planning ice queen from Gone Girl, and makes the great archetype. She writes these crime novels and plans the whole thing, but it's just absolutely not true. And as for the planting of the drugs? She was not out there that night. And that great 68 exclamation point ending to that crazy email? Kent now said he added that part to make his wife, to himself to make his wife look crazy. 
The Easterns have more stories about their crime than that guy in the movie Split has personalities. We'll never know exactly what happened, and more importantly, why what seems like such a small incident, such a small slight to their son, led to such an insane plot. Oh, and about that reference Kent made to Jill writing crime novels? About the time where they're committing the crime, Jill Easter, under a pen name, published a novel entitled Holding House. She and Kent created a promotional spot for it on YouTube, which is still up. You can watch it. It's narrated by Kent and starts out with this. If you knew how to commit the perfect crime, would you do it? The questions the Easters should have asked were, if you could commit the most amateurist, idiotic crime for no good reason, would you do it? Would you try to frame someone after you spent months making it clear to everyone that you headed out for her, so you'd be the chief suspect if anyone suspects a frame? Would you make it so obvious that it was a frame? Would you bring your cell phone with you when you were committing the crime and exchange a huge number of texts at that time? Would you make a call to the police that sounded like a fake call with a fake name and fake phone number that was easily traceable from a spot where your presence was recorded on camera? Would you, leave, would you leave your DNA on the planet drugs? Would you do all this because at worst, someone made a slight insult about your son and left him outside a few minutes? And would you do so if being, bent, caught meant being caught meant financial and career ruin? But I guess that tagline wouldn't sell many books. Nor would there be any suspense, because the obvious answer is, not a chance, fool! Yet for some reason, the Easter said, sounds good to me, when can I start? This was not really thought out very well. That's one of the great understatements of all time. It might be more accurate to say that no thought was given at all. The civil case judge said, quote, they're not exactly master criminals out of Bolt Hall and UCLA. I'm sure those schools aren't thrilled to be associated with these two. Indeed, they don't even call Bolt Hall anymore. They claim it's because Bolt was an anti-Chinese bigot, but maybe it was really to distance themselves from Jill Easter. But actually, those schools should actually have some pride in the judge's statement. They're supposed to train people how to practice law, not break it. So stay on the right side of the law, because going to law school doesn't teach you how to get away with a crime. And committing a crime could well get you disbarred. You don't want pictures of you that look like this to be on the internet. <laughs>